What we thought then is, is it possible to think of this phrase as a metaphor for what we're seeing in that image? Is it the same concept that's reified in two different forms? So that kolabi becomes the extraction, it's the extraction from the um, serpent and the sooty opening. And this is what became interesting for us. Uhol sabak is, hol is just a portal or it's an opening and sabak is sooty, which is where um, Royce gets this idea of smut. But if you think of a sooty opening as basically just what happens when you burn something and you have that fiery charcoal hole, then it's out of that fire and out of that charcoal that the smoke arises, that the serpent arises, and that you get a conjuring experience out of it. And when you see it in that way, then it's tied very closely to a lot of other imagery that we have. Um, and it makes better sense of the text itself on a, a, lar a broader scope. And this was part of the irony of this project, is we were trying to work so hard to get at local meanings, and we found that we were pulling at threads that brought us into broader and broader contexts um, for the work. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, you have seven minutes. Good. OK. So, um, so what you're seeing in this text is Yashun Balam. He's a ruler from Yashchilan. And in this case, the, um, the operative verb here is tsak. And it's what they used to call the fishing hand glyph. We can translate tsak now um, transparently as to conjure. But figuratively, it's shown as a fishing hand, which is kind of like pescando. It's like, in, 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 the Sp in Spanish, it keeps that same idea, right? You're hunting, right? You're, you're grabbing. And so it's on the one hand incredibly challenging to hold a fish in your hand, but it's also a different kind of violence from just a straight battle. And if we pull this idea of um, tzak back into the original context, then we're no longer looking at a, a battle of one force over another force, oshlehuntiku over bolontiku, but we're now looking at something more like a hunt or a capture for the nourishment of a community. So what this does for us is this gets us to the hearts of seeds because now we're, going, we're able to see that there's a, a, a greater consistency between what we had, that struggle, that battle, this one phrase, um, and what comes after it, which is um, not complicated in most interpretations. And that is that Bolon Sakab, who's related to Bolon Tiku, takes the hearts of seeds. It's, it's literal, it's saying it's not the seeds themselves. It gives us a whole bunch of seeds. Um, pumpkin seeds, beans, all these different seeds, but it's not the seeds that he takes. It's the hearts of the seeds, or the, or the soul of the seeds, that he takes up into the placenta of the 13th level of the sky. So now when you get into the placenta of the 13th level of the sky, we're jumping back into classic Mayan imagery. So if we go to Copan, this is also a very well-known image. This is the lintel of the inner doorway of structure 22 at Kuban. And so there's a drawing of it by Linda Sheely that makes it a little easier to parse. What you're seeing here is what we call a cosmogram. You have the underworld in the bottom, right, represented by the skulls. You have the middle world, which is where we all live, by the people. And then on the top is a representation of the sky. It represents the sky by um, highlighting the Milky Way itself. This is a celestial dragon that is a representation of a version of the Milky Way that you can see in the night sky. And so you can see there's all these ek or star icons all over it. Um, oops, sorry. There's a front head, which is very dragon crocodilian over here on the left. And then on the far side, there's a second head, and it's got some stuff going on with it that we can see better from the same, rep the same an image, a representation of the same entity at Palenque. Here it becomes more transparent. You're looking at here the crocodilian fig figure in front, the body is made up of the sky, and then the back is, has been giving people trouble for a long time because they say, is this a rear head? Like, what is going on? Why are there two heads? Um, in my dissertation, and then more recently, Carl Tauba has kind of confirmed this, we think it's an, it's an animation of the womb of the celestial dragon. Right? So it gets us back to this notion of for female fertility in the placenta and where reside the hearts of the seeds, not the seeds themselves, but the hearts of the seeds. And this is what we may be seeing in this chulel, in this kuch, in this flowing um, material coming out of the body of the Milky Way. If we take that perspective, then we're seeing how this is all tied to the conjuring rituals. And you can see that the bloodletting bowl is the same um, as the animated womb of the celestial dragon and as that thing that you can use as a ritual implement to um, reveal your ancestors. <laughs> And what that does is it helps us see that there's this much greater narrative going on, apparently going on, um, not just at Copan, not just during the late classic, but also during the early classic, 
um, representations of that celestial substance and how it can be replaced by ancestors themselves. They go, one, they go hand in hand, ancestors and that celestial fluid. And the argument then becomes that this isn't just something that they had in stories and that they could kind of imagine, but it was also something you could observe in the night sky. And if, many, if any of you have gone out to see like actual dark skies where the Milky Way is clear, you can see this. It might be opaque in this image, but I kind of help you out with my very crude drawing there. Um, take it away. And then hopefully you can see that there's a celestial dragon there, and out of his mouth comes spilling that um, celestial fluid. Which takes us to Teotihuacan, and now I'm going to go super fast because I have no time left. Um, um, the, the image that we saw at um, Yaxchilan was the same image, or had some of the same iconography that took us back to Teotihuacan itself. I hope you can see in this rendition of a celestial dragon at Teotihuacan, there's the same kind of material coming out of his mouth. This is from a mural at Teotihuacan. And in this representation, I hope you can kind of see it's, um, it's, it's filtered, so you can see more light there, but there's a similar dragon in the Milky Way itself. Um, this takes us to Teotihuacan because we find that this is urban planning at its greatest in ancient Mex Mesoamerica. Um, the Mikaot, the street of the dead, why did they call it that? It may very well be because it's related to this orientation. Scholars have argued for a long time, what does this orientation mean? And for the most part, they'll say, it's because if you sit at the top of the pyramid of the sun and you wait for a star to rise or the Pleiades to rise at a certain time over the horizon, then there was that one magic moment when you could see it and that was the focus of the alignment. I think that's kind of pushing it a little bit to say that it was all constructed for that one visibility. And I think that there's a better interpretation. And it has to do with the fact that during certain parts of the year, the Milky Way itself stretches out across the sky so that it rises from um, the end of the Street of the Dead, which, which um, terminates in Cerro Gordo, which is recognized as um, La Locan, or the repository of souls. And then uh, the celestial fluid part dumps out into the Street of the Dead itself. So that what it looks like, there's a whole lot of calculations that I'm just running roughshod over here. I apologize for that. Um, but it looks like what we're seeing is a, a way, a time during the year when the Milky Way connects their repository of souls to the street itself that leads into the main plazas of the city. And one of the reasons why it's important to go back to that lintel from um, Yashilan is because they're marking that serpent with Tlaloc masks at the beginning and at the end. And so they're saying that there's something Tlaloc-like um, about this serpent at Yashilan, and we know that these folks were connected to these folks, so it's not like we're just patching things at random. What I'd like to suggest then is that we're seeing is that the abstract figures that we call the Serpiente Emplumado at um, Teotihuacan are really not related to Quetzalcoatl. Instead, they're representations of the celestial dragon. And it's not some abstract idea. It's a representation of what we see in the night sky. There's the dragon on one end and Tlaloc on the other end, which is where it comes out. And so I would like to think, and so I'm ending right now, um, if we could imagine what Teotihuacan would have been like during this visibility, it may have been something akin to what we think of today as the Day of the Dead, <coughs> when your ancestors could come back from Tlalocan, come out into the streets, and you could all party together. Thank you.